We are honored to have Dr. Lansing Taylor provide today's lecture. Dr. Taylor is currently the director of the University of Pittsburgh Drug Discovery Institute. He began his academic career at Harvard University and remained at Harvard until 1982. Dr. Taylor then moved to Carnegie Mellon University as professor of biological science and the director of the Center for Fluorescent Research. His research interests are linking large-scale cell and tissue profiling with computational and systems biology to optimize drug discovery. I'm sure you're going to enjoy today's lecture. Hello, my name is Lance Taylor, and I'm pleased today to be speaking on quantitative systems pharmacology, or QSP, in drug discovery. The agenda for my presentation starts with discussing the present paradigm of drug discovery and the status of discovering and developing therapeutics. Next, I'll introduce precision medicine to make sure we see the connection to quantitative systems pharmacology. This is important because of the challenge due to patient heterogeneity. Then I'll introduce quantitative systems pharmacology, or QSP, a new paradigm for drug discovery. And finally, I'll introduce a platform for applying QSP for drug discovery and development. Reductionism has been a major driver in the recent history of biology and drug discovery. And this is characterized by identifying all of the components of a complex system, in this case it's a car, and understanding how those individual components work and then reassembling the knowledge into the whole system. Humans are complex systems and reductionism is a challenge. There are 13 major organ systems, there's two to 300 cell types, 10 to 50 trillion total human cells, 13 to 20,000 protein encoding genes, approximately 300 different post-translational modifications, greater than 7,000 binary interactions between proteins, over 2,700 metabolites, and approximately 100,000 nodes in the interactome, as well as many different DNA and RNA variants. So that thinking about identifying an individual molecular target within this complex array is a major challenge and has been one of the difficulties in the present paradigm of drug discovery. We know that humans are heterogeneous systems, and this adds a further challenge for drug discovery and precision medicine. We're aware of the heterogeneity between patients in a population, but it's also a fact that there's heterogeneity within a single patient, going from the whole body to organs and tissues and cells and the com major components that make up the cells. This is important because these are potential molecular targets for drugs, and many of these are modified due to mutations. We also know that these components and others interact in time and space within pathways that bring about either normal cellular functions or abnormalities due to disease. One of the things that is a core component of quantitative systems pharmacology is building computational networks. This is the quantitative part of the system. Uh, this is based on a field of mathematics called graph theory, and this enables investigators to literally uh, develop a computational model of a disease process where it can then be used to predict changes, and then they can be experimentally tested. So the present paradigm of drug discovery uses uh, target-centric discovery. Uh, this is also called molecular-based discovery. It starts with uh, basic science in a therapeutic area, and then the next step is to do target identification, uh, usually a protein, but other macromolecules are being approached today. Uh, then there's target validation, and this is usually done by a knockdown experiment in a disease model. And then assays are developed in order to look at this particular uh, 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 target uh, under investigation. Then there's screening, lead generation, lead optimization through medicinal chemistry, early safety profiling and in vitro, in vitro ADME, and then preclinical 
testing in animals, and then phase one, two, and three in clinical trials. In the last few years, computational methods have been applied to the standard methods, including computational methods for docking uh, molecules into the target in order to optimize the, the medicinal chemistry steps. The advantage of this approach is that you can investigate a single mechanism of action on one target. The disadvantage is that target modulation may not produce sufficient therapeutic index, and multiple target modulation may be important. In the last few years, a, uh, a separate method called phenotypic discovery has been applied. And here you're not starting with an isolated identified molecular target, but you find modulators of disease phenotypes or functions. In this example, we can see a, a, a transcription factor that's found in the cytoplasm. In this figure, uh, it's green. And upon activation, it translocates into the nucleus where it can regulate a set of genes. In this assay, we want to find molecules for example, that block this translocation. And it may involve interaction with one or multiple targets within multiple pathways. So in phenotypic discovery, we start again with the basic science in the therapeutic area. We identify a phenotype that we want to manipulate. We validate that phenotype. And then do assay development and screening. This time usually with image-based screening called high-content screening then do lead generation, early safety profiling, lead optimization, early safety profiling, in vitro ADME. And now because we don't yet know the molecular target or targets, we can apply chemical proteomics in order to identify the molecular target. Then we move on to preclinical testing and clinical trials, one, two, and three. Once again, computational methods have been applied in the last few years, including doing uh, uh, studies with RNA-seq where we can infer pathways of disease progression that these uh, functions may involve. The advantage is that the molecular targets are unknown, so there can be a focus more on function in the pathways and networks. The disadvantage is that there is a need to identify molecular candidates uh, uh, sometime during the process, and these assays usually have a lower throughput. By 2015, the Pharma Research and uh, Manufacturing Association, which is a trade organization that most of the big pharmaceutical companies belong to, did an analysis of the state of the field. First of all, the average time to develop a drug is greater than 10 years, and the percentage, percentage of drugs that actually get out of clinical trials to make it to becoming a drug is less than 12%. The development costs have increased dramatically over the years. For example, in 1980, it was a little over 400 million a year, whereas in 2010, it was already over $2 billion a year. The R&D spending has also increased. Again, comparing to 1980, it was only about $2 billion a year. And in 2014, it was already over $50 billion a year. And finally, there's been an impact of generics on sales, which means revenue to the industry. In 2000, there was less than 50% of the sales of prescriptions, uh, less than 50%. By 2013, it was almost 90%. So looking at the reasons for the drug failures, which has made the cost of developing therapeutics so high, we see that over 50% of the reasons are based on efficacy, and uh, less than that, but an important impact is that of safety. So this leads us to the, the opinion that we need to explore new paradigms for drug discovery and development. So the pharmaceutical industry has made progress over the years. A best example of that is looking at uh, the effect on attrition of PK measurements. Between 1991 and 2000, 
using a combination of computational approaches and experimental approaches, there was a dramatic decrease in the impact of PK analyses on attrition. But there's still a serious attrition based on efficacy and toxicity. So the major challenge for the pharmaceutical industry today is the drug attrition rate in phase two clinical trials. About 80% of new drugs that enter phase two clinical trials fail. And the major reason is drug efficacy. Some of the explanations for those failures include targeting the wrong mechanism, targeting the wrong patient population, suboptimal dosing of the drug for the right target, and drug combination therapies actually being needed for the disease. The present paradigm of drug discovery also depends on animal models and testing. So for animal studies, we know the physiology is very distinct between animals and man. So for example, the concordance of target organ toxicity between laboratory animals and man is not very good. Using the example of the liver, or in this slide, hepatic, it's only about 50% concordant between human and animal testing in toxicity. It also has a very low throughput. It's very expensive to uh, uh, use animals. The methods actually date to the 1930s. And there's an increasing amount of societal pressure to minimize the use of experimental animals in uh, drug discovery and testing. So there is value in finding alternatives to animal testing and creating a new paradigm for drug discovery. Although I've identified multiple things that are not optimal in the present paradigm of drug discovery, we have developed some significant drugs uh, for HIV AIDS, for hypercholesterolemia, chronic myelogenous leukemia, autoimmune diseases, and HER2 positive breast cancer. These are all great drugs. The only challenge has been it's been very inefficient in developing these drugs. So one of the things that I want to put in perspective when I start talking about quantitative systems pharmacology is precision medicine. Uh, this is an approach for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account individual differences in lifestyle, environment, and biology. In an important paper that was published in 2015 by Francis Collins and Harold Varmus, they defined uh, precision medicine uh, uh, as the prevention and treatment strategies that take individual variability into account. It, it is not new. Blood typing, for instance, has been used to guide blood transfusions for more than a century. But the prospect of applying this concept broadly has been dramatically improved by the recent development of large-scale biologic databases, such as the human genome sequence, as well as powerful methods for characterizing patients, such as proteomics, metabolomics, genomics, diverse cellular assays, and even mobile health technology, and computational tools for analyzing large sets of data. This slide shows the flow of information in precision medicine today. Starting on the left with an individual patient, you can collect clinical characteristics uh, from the electronic health records, and then data based on uh, genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics. That can be added to prior knowledge, such as physiology, biochemistry, cell and molecular biology, all of this information being fed into building a network on that patient and the disease. In terms of network theory, all of the components that make up the network are referred to as nodes, and all the connections between these components are referred to as edges. And again, the mathematical field that drives the development of an analysis of these networks is called graph theory. So the idea is to create a large number of these networks and this library of networks of human diseases that are patient-specific can then be used in making predictions about therapeutic strategies for the patients. So at the present time, precision medicine is driven to find the right existing therapeutic, 
getting it to the right patient at the right dose and at the right time. So now I will introduce quantitative systems pharmacology, which is a new paradigm for drug discovery and development. And this really uh, had its birth in two workshops held at the NIH, one in 2008 and in late 2010, and it included representatives from academia, industry, and government that reviewed the state of the art in two very quantitative fields that were then distinct, systems biology and pharmacology, to determine if a combination of these two disciplines might transform drug discovery, development, and clinical uses of therapeutics. And a white paper was published, which is listed at the bottom of this slide, indicating that there was a need for new approaches to drug discovery and development through the introduction of concepts, technologies, and researchers from the fields of computational biology, systems biology, and biological engineering to pharmacology. This new field of QSP has roots in classical pharmacology and physiology, but adds a molecular and systems level approach that allows the investigation of the responses to drug treatments in the context of complex signaling transcriptional and metabolic networks, and the patient variability. There's a very good definition of QSP in this uh, white paper, and it's defined as an approach to translational medicine that combines computational and experimental methods to elucidate, validate, and apply new pharmacological concepts to the development and use of small molecule and biologic drugs, Further, QSP will provide an integrated systems level approach to determining mechanisms of action of new and existing drugs in preclinical and animal models and in patients. QSP will also create the knowledge needed to change complex cellular networks in a specified way with mono or combination therapies, alter the pathophysiology of disease so as to maximize therapeutic benefit and minimize toxicity and implement a precision medicine approach to improving the health of individual patients. This figure describes the uh, difference between how the pharmaceutical industry was beginning to investigate QSP around 2010 and academia. On the right side uh, is what the pharmaceutical industry was doing back in 2010 and continues that today. And that is uh, focusing on systems pharmacology, particularly PK and PD analyses, especially in the phase one, two, and three, and now four phases of clinical trials. In contrast, in academia, they focused on systems biology, chemical biology, and genetically engineered mouse models building computational network models, doing target identification, screening using chemical biology. And in the, in, in the middle of those was chemistry and animal studies being applied by both. However, it was clear there was a disconnect between these two directions and it had to be brought together. And QSP promises to make this a functional continuum. There's also the complexity in thinking about systems biology and systems pharmacology separately. Systems biology kind of represents a horizontal integration of understanding how drugs interact with targets, target in cells, cellular networks, and multicellular networks. This is a focus of systems biology that has been present. The vertical in integration comes from systems pharmacology where people started studying the interaction of drugs with purified components, cells, organs, animals, patients, and populations with the goal of all of the technical applications to get to the point of uh, defining the systematic, holistic understanding of drug action. This is an integrated view of quantitative systems pharmacology. One of the things that became apparent was that we needed a new type of investigator in order to join the drug discovery uh, team. 
So uh, when we incorporate computational modeling and simulation into the pharmaceutical R&D uh, function with experimentation, we have to start by gathering all of that data, the big data with the analytics, build the computational model. You can then make uh, uh, predictions uh, from that model and then do the hypothesis testing through experimentation. This leads us to the point which is the key in QSP in that it's an integrated and iterative computational and experimental approach. With the standard drug discovery scientists, we now have to add computational scientists, modeling engineers, data programmers, and computational biologists. In building these uh, simulation and computational models, we start with a model scope where we have to identify physiological pathways, disease processes, organ systems, pharmacology, pharmacokinetics that are to be included in the model. Then develop detailed physiological maps representing the model variables and their interactions. The next step is model development. And in fact, there are models floating around that have been under development, so you can collect prior models, non-clinical and clinical data that will be used to develop mathematical relationships in the model, apply mathematical functions to describe the rates of processes in the model, and the volumes of all the physiological compartments. In the next step, which is the model qualification, you collect the relevant clinical data in patient populations so it would be used to calibrate and qualify the model, and then calibrate the model at all relevant scales of time and physiology. In these QSP-inspired computational uh, models, uh, there's multiple steps. One, to analyze the networks to identify optimal points of intervention, remembering that we're not starting with a isolated molecular target, but we're identifying processes defined by uh, networks. We then use models to improve selection of primary and backup targets. We model outcomes and variants, predict on-target and off-target safety, model absorption distribution, metabolism, excretion, and target engagement, sustain target validation throughout drug development, and model therapeutic repurposing. This requires the integration of diverse data sources into the computational models, bringing about the need for the new areas of so-called big data and analytics for patients. We bring together data uh, that's mechanistic from in vitro studies, target characteristics, drug properties, in vivo data, human physiology, genetic information, as well as human pathology based on prior clinical data. This is all fed into the construction of the network. Uh, the mathematical equations there are, represent the fact that uh, ordinary differential equations are usually used to develop these uh, mathematical models. Once the model is in place and validated, it can then be used to make translational predictions. And I'll give an example in a few slides. So computational modeling has evolved in terms of different levels of mechanistic detail. Starting with the drug focus, early models were focused on PK and PD, and they described the gathered data but did not uh, attempt to make quantitative insights into underlying mechanisms because there wasn't enough detail. It just explained the data at hand. You can increase the mechanistic detail, and this has now been done using pharmacology-based PK uh, models. And this uh, fa facilitates the use of additional mechanistic data to make predictions. And now there are even commercial packages that uh, perform this uh, computational work. Finally, with the disease focus, this requires a large amount of mechanistic detail so the mechanistic data for predictions of efficacy or changes in safety signals are a focus. 
So in getting started with computational modeling, there's already a large number of computational models available in the public domain. This is one site that is worth uh, investigating. It's the Biomodels database, and it's managed by the European Molecular Biology uh, Laboratory, and the link is shown in the slide. So multi-scale networks are needed to understand and to predict drug action. And this starts all the way back with computational modeling of drug receptor inter interactions or drug target interactions, the so-called atomic or molecular interactions scale. That is fed into cellular and tissue level networks. And those then are used to help build organ level networks and physiology. With the ultimate goal is we want to do whole body outcome predictions, looking at things like what affects blood pressure control, heart attack, arrhythmia issues. So in order to understand the mechanisms of drug action and predict efficacy, we have to integrate these network models from the molecular le level all the way through to the human. So I'll give an example of how one of these uh, computational models is used. Uh, and this is uh, on asthma, which is a chronic inflammatory disease involving many immunological and stromal pathways. This table lists the things that were taken into consideration and quantified uh, within the model. That included innate immune cells, adaptive immune cells, including Thi2 uh, lymphocytes, uh, and that's something I'll focus on in the example I give, airway resident cells, soluble mediators, clinical measurements, including uh, the forced expiratory volume in one second, uh, that's called uh, uh, FEV1. Interventions used to develop the model, these are known drugs with known targets that can be used to manipulate the network. And then patient types, including uh, patient subtypes, which I'll use in the example I give of Thi2 high <clears throat> patients, patients that have a large number of uh, Thi2 uh, lymphocytes. So in A in this figure, we see the uh, computational network that's been uh, developed. It includes the airway stroma and functions, cytokines and chemokines, adaptive Im immun immun immunity, uh, innate immunity, as well as the therapeutic interventions. And I'll just focus on the top graph in B, uh, where uh, we had a patient sample uh, or cohort that had high Thi2 uh, 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 as patients. And it was demonstrated that a single agent uh, that was an anti-IL-13 showed in the solid blue line an increase in the FEV1 capability of the patient. It was then predicted from the computational model that using a bispecific uh, molecule that included anti-IL-13 plus a proprietary uh, target would increase the FEV1. And in fact, experimentally shown here with the blue dotted line, the experiment matched the prediction. So this is a key value of in incorporating simulations and quantitative models in drug discovery uh, very early on is that you can avoid making a large number of experiments, make predictions, and test those predictions. In addition, mechanistic, the mechanistic basis of the model allowed investigation of which pathways drove the predicted response, and it also predicted changes in the circulating eosinophils, which is actually a biomarker for asthma. So we uh, uh, decided to define QSP in a more functional way. And so our definition of QSP, which we published on a year or so ago, was determining the mechanisms of disease progression and mechanisms of action of drugs on multi-scale systems through iterative and integrated computational and experimental methods to optimize the development of therapeutic strategies. This is a simple summary of uh, the approach, uh, which at the same time advances precision medicine through quantitative systems pharmacology. 
So presently, precision medicine is practiced today, as I mentioned before, you start with patients, patient data, you get patient samples to perform the various omics analyses, like genomics, then use patient data analytics to extract information from that data, and patient big data management, and then you're in a position to predict, make predictions from patient data using computational and systems biology. This is the point where I mentioned before you get the right drug to the right patient. You can continue around this circle uh, in order to practice, and uh, by the way, at this point you're only able to get existing drugs to the right patient at the right time at the right dose. If you want to develop new therapeutics, you continue around this circle, implement therapeutic area basic science, develop experimental models of disease, and in our perspective, they need to be human-based experimental models, build computational models of the disease, and then apply the usual drug discovery sciences. In implementing this, you get both precision medicine and precision drug discovery. So I mentioned before that humans are heterogeneous systems, and it's a further challenge for drug discovery and precision medicine. I've introduced the concept of the networks, computational models to make predictions and then test those predictions. Uh, but we need a better experimental platform as well, uh, remembering QSP is both computational and experimental. So one of the things that is under active development in many laboratories is building human tissue-based experimental models, either 3D models in standard microplates or more recently and potentially more powerfully in microfluidic uh, devices. The real impact of this technology for building better human experimental models will be brought around by the use of induced pluripotent stem cells from patients themselves. So you can have the proper genetic background in uh, developing experimental models as well as the proper disease uh, background. We've actually developed a platform to functionally uh, uh, do a continuum from precision medicine to drug discovery. Again, we're focused on patients and patient samples and data. It's also possible to have validated target knowledge from the literature. An example of that that I'll use is that we know in metastatic breast cancer there are mutations in the ligand binding domain of the estrogen receptors. This is well established and we want to incorporate that into our knowledge and models. But we also do an unbiased study where we can infer pathways of disease progression. And we do this in metastatic breast cancer by performing RNA-seq on both primary tumors and the metastatic tumors. And then using computational methods to infer the pathways of disease progression from primary to metastatic state. Once you have these inferred pathways of disease progression, this is now essentially a list of molecular targets within each one of those pathways. And we can use tools such as machine learning and databases of drugs and targets like Drug Bank and Stitch and actually make predictions about what existing drugs could interact with the targets in your listed pathways. This is actually an important step for uh, 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 repurposing drugs, as well as making uh, tools uh, to probe the experimental systems. So in the next step, we make phenotypic models of disease and safety. Again, we focus on human-based models, particularly using microfluidic systems. And like any other uh, manipulation approach, uh, there's tools such as RNAIs, CRISPR, and mutant cDNA libraries and annotated focus compound libraries that can be used to manipulate the experimental models. Uh, profiling is done by high content screening, and a key element of this approach is the fact you get heterogeneity analysis at the same time because by imaging these devices, you're measuring cell by cell uh, so that any heterogeneity is quantified. Coming out of those uh, screens, are potentially drug hits from profiling, and those can be the drugs that were predicted uh, in the machine learning stage, 
or from the focus compound libraries. And of course, medicinal chemistry can be applied right away to optimize uh, these uh, molecules. Uh, again, we don't know at this point what the molecular target or targets are. So at this point, we implement chemical proteomics and RNAi knockdown studies in order to identify the molecular targets uh, that are involved in the phenotypic uh, manipulation. Once you've identified those molecular targets, you can revert to traditional target-centric drug discovery and do the medicinal chemistry based on target-centric work. We also build mammalian models of disease and safety as part of the multi-scale needs. And from published literature, as well as the assay data generated here, we can uh, construct the computational models. So once a computational model is constructed, it's not going to be complete with one round. So this is an iterative process. We can go back around this, uh, make predictions from the computational model, test those predictions by using RNA knockdowns, for example, uh, rerun the assays, and then update the model. And you can do that uh, very early on in the drug discovery process before you get to expensive steps. Because this is a systems biology approach, essentially, you expect disease-specific emergent properties, like optimal therapeutic strategies, PD biomarkers of drugs, and prognostic and predictive uh, biomarkers. And of course, you want to get to the point of helping to design a clinical trial and then simulate that cl uh, clinical trial. So this slide kind of is a simple summary of the first part of uh, that uh, uh, QSP uh, approach, and that's the computational and database selection of existing drugs to probe the modulation of the phenotype. So on the left, we can see uh, patient RNA-seq data from a normal versus a disease state, or the example I gave, a primary tumor versus a metastatic tumor. This identifies uh, uh, genes that are upregulated or downregulated. From those genes, we can infer the pathways of disease progression that they take part in. From that, you can uh, uh, determine molecular targets from those pathways. And then you can use the database and machine learning uh, to computationally predict drugs that would interact with those targets. And then those predicted drugs can be experimentally tested in a human-based uh, uh, phenotypic model of the disease. I'll take a short uh, tack here to add a, an important new omic in our perspective, uh, and that is really uh, characterizing and quantifying the tumor microenvironment based on computational pathology, which we think is an important new omic to add to genomics, proteomics, et cetera. On the right, you can see a classic uh, diagram of a, a tumor. It's very heterogeneous. There's cancer cells at different stages of genomic evolution. There's normal epithelial cells. Uh, there's uh, uh, migratory immune cells that have infiltrated into the tumor. Uh, so it's a complex tumor microenvironment. And it's been demonstrated in recent years that depending on the makeup and the spatial relationships within the tumor of these different types of cells, the tumors can respond differentially uh, to different therapeutic agents. So we want to characterize the tumor microenvironment, determine the cellular content, the state of activation of cells like immune cells, and then define quantitatively the spatial relationships between the cells. Then we can infer mechanistic basis of disease progression using network systems biology, but based on the cells and their spatial relationships within the tumor. Uh, it's possible to create prognostic and diagnostic tests to then recapitulate the tumor microenvironment in a human experimental model, and then iterate computational experimental models of disease to further uh, develop uh, a therapeutic strategy. So uh, the key is to quantifying spatial interactions. And the measurement of multiple biomarkers in tissue sections, coupled with machine learning tools to characterize the spatial interactions 
and infer signaling networks responsible for tumor progression is a major area of development today. So if we start with a primary tumor, uh, we can take tissue sections and now label it with multiple uh, fluorescently based uh, antibodies for key uh, tumor and uh, non-tumor cells. Uh, multiplexed fluorescence is anything from one to seven different biomarkers in a single section. And then hyperplexed fluorescence involves cyclical labeling, imaging, quenching of fluorescence, and rounds of labeling to look at up to 50 or 60 different biomarkers in the same section. Uh, the spatial analysis uh, is, is developed first by learning patterns of each individual cell in the field to view what biomarkers it is showing a positive uh, response for. And then each cell is identified and then around it spatially defining who's near it. This can be quantified by a machine learning approach called pointwise mutual information. So you can literally define the tumor microenvironment based on spatial relationships between different types of cells. When you know the different types of cells and how close they are to one another, you can infer the signaling networks that exist between those cells. And this, uh, we believe, will lead to better diagnoses, prognoses, and uh, therapeutic strategies. So moving to the experimental models of disease, one of the major advantage, uh, advances made over the last five or six years is the development of human microphysiology systems, or MPS, as experimental models in uh, drug discovery and development. This is a program put together as a collaboration between the NIH, particularly NCATS, DARPA, the FDA, and the EPA. The goal was uh, constructing microfluidic 3D human organs on chips, linking these organs together in a platform to provide physiologically correct human model systems, and in particular, incorporating induced pluripotent stem cell, derived cells, in order to test drugs with distinct uh, genomic backgrounds and against disease models for uh, precision or personalized uh, medicine. So this slide shows kind of a platform that has been developed to make a 3D microfluidic uh, liver for experimentally modeling liver diseases, uh, phenotypic screening, and for early safety testing. In the upper left, uh, we have uh, the description of the present generation model. It involves cell Key, four key cell types from the liver. Uh, it's uh, layered to the point where there's a separation between a, uh, a, a, the hepatic chamber and a vascular chamber, so you can move things through the system just like it occurs within the liver. You can also take a subset of the liver cells and label them with fluorescently labeled biosensors, so you can measure things in real time such as ROS production, and apoptosis. Since these microfluidic devices are under continuous flow, like blood flow within an organ, you can take media efflux and sample it for secreted proteins, measuring oxygen and pH, and metabolic readouts uh, using mass spec. With the biosensors, you use high content imaging, and various of uh, the sentinel cells can be analyzed in time, again, for a, a variety of physiological readouts. All of this data is then captured in what is called the Microphysiology Systems Database, where you can also import data from other databases. Because the ultimate goal here is to not only acquire, uh, analyze uh, the data from these devices, but also do the computational modeling. In building a liver experimental uh, model for uh, drug discovery, uh, the focus has been on the liver acenus. It's a basic unit of the liver. Uh, the blood flow into the one end of the liver acenus is very high in oxygen. Uh, that's called zone one. And by the time the, uh, the media or the blood flows through the liver, there's a consumption of oxygen principally by the hepatocytes. So by the time the blood flow gets to the central lane, uh, vein, uh, the oxygen tension is very low. 
So there are four major cell types, the hepatocytes, the endothelial cells, the Kupfer cells, and the stellate cells that make up the, the liver acenus. And the goal is to recapitulate the content as well as the 3D structure and function. So this slide shows uh, the 28-day 20 20 function of the initial liver microphysiology system. Uh, and it's characterized by uh, lasting at least a month, as evidenced by the lack of LDH release once it's stabilized. It also uh, demonstrated high levels of albumin and urea synthesis, more physiological than in static uh, co-cultures. Uh, we were able to demonstrate that the SIPS activities and the phase two conjugations were maintained during that month. And you can induce fibrosis within the liver with methotrexate treatment. Uh, because the stellate cells were activated, they expressed smooth muscle actin, and they also produced uh, collagen. Could also demonstrate immune-mediated hepatotoxicity by combining LPS with a drug like trovofloxacin that induced uh, apoptosis. So the second generation uh, model was called the LAMPS a liver acenus microphysiology system. Uh, its physiology was uh, improved by the addition, as you see here in purple, of a thin layer of liver extracellular matrix put down between the hepatocytes and the endothelial cells representing the space of DC within the liver acenus. Uh, this model uh, maintained its three-dimensional structure and all of the activities described in the first generation uh, but we also recapitulated zone one and zone three in separate devices to explore the, the biology uh, of, of the microenvironment. So uh, we created zone one and zone three models by modulating the oxygen tension within the devices. Uh, this slide shows uh, biological data demonstrating that the microenvironment of zone one and zone three with known biological uh, uh, activity differences uh, were recapitulated. Uh, zone one data is shown in red, zone three in blue. And as expected in zone one, uh, albumin, urea uh, secretion was greater than in zone three. Oxidative phosphorylation, no surprise because of the high oxygen tension, is higher in zone one. And glucose levels were higher in zone one. Also, as expected, alpha-1 antitrypsin secretion was higher in zone 3 than in zone 1. CYP2E1 uh, expression was higher in zone 3, as was the ability to induce steatosis higher in zone 3 than in 1. And acetaminophen toxicity was higher in zone 3 and zone 1. So now we have a model that biologically is representing what is going on within the liver, so now we can do more experimental manipulations and create disease states within these microenvironments. So one of the diseases that we've been exploring is metastatic uh, breast cancer and creating a metastatic niche within these liver uh, devices. And uh, the communication between the cancer cells and the endogenous cells within the liver are actually very important. And this is evidenced by the fact that since we are interested in the ligand binding domain uh, mutations, we have a wild type uh, MCF7 cell. Uh, and these MCF7 cells are labeled with a fluorescent protein so we can measure them within uh, the device. You can see on the upper right, uh, data, image data sets of red cells, and we're quantifying uh, growth by the measurement of the number of fluorescent cells. But we also use CRISPR uh, in order to put in mutations, two of the major mutations uh, within uh, the uh, uh, estrogen uh, receptor, uh, one called Y537S and the other called D538G. And if you look at the bottom left, when we did traditional 2D experimentation with these MCF7 cells, we found that uh, the gray line, which represented the D538G mutation, 
it had a growth advantage over the other mutant as well as wild type. However, when we put those same cells in the presence of the liver microenvironment, particularly within the LAMPS models, we found there's a switch and that in fact the mutation Y537S actually gained the growth advantage. So now we're in a position to explore the effects of different drug treatments within a microenvironment which is more or less recapitulating the microenvironment within, uh, uh, within a, a liver in a metastatic uh, disease and demonstrates that you really don't want to be using uh, 2D models because they don't reflect the physiological uh, activity uh, in vivo. So then, uh, obviously, since this is iterative, computational, and experimental uh, work, uh, we were interested in a particular set of uh, pathways. And so uh, we wanted to untangle the, uh, uh, the uh, insulin-like growth factor 1 from insulin signaling in breast cancer. And this uh, uh, slide just shows the continuum of generating data, in this case the data was a reverse phase protein array, uh, and then a co building computational models. First a statistical inference model, uh, which could then be uh, tested, uh, hypothesis generated and tested, and then uh, building mechanistic predictions and testing those. So it's a whole uh, sequence of things that are ongoing work. Uh, but in looking at uh, the computational model and how we could use it, uh, we know that the IGF and the insulin receptors share 60% of their sequence, and that factors bind to each other's receptors, and that hybrid receptors can form, and signaling pathways share downstream components. So a key question is how do we specifically target only one of the two highly overlapping pathways? The answer is building a computational model and then testing it. So in uh, testing uh, the model, we started with the RPPA data, which had 134 phosphoproteins in the array, 21 different cancer cell lines, looked at six different time points of stimulation from five minutes to 48 hours using stimulation of either IGF-1 or insulin stimulation. So from that data, there was an influence uh, uh, graph uh, developed of the major components. And there some were involved in, that, that's the purple arrows, IGF-1 only interactions, and some were ins insulin only interactions. But one of the key things we were able to do is based on this uh, uh, network is to make a prediction. Uh, and the first prediction was that if we knock down ACC, uh, the MAP-K uh, activation was predicted to be higher with IGF-1 stimulation than with insulin stimulation. And looking at the, uh, uh, the western blots uh, at the bottom of that, uh, you can see the IGF-1 had a larger effect than the insulin, as uh, was predicted. Similarly, it was predicted that the ECAD knockdown, uh, the effect on uh, AKT activation was predicted to be higher, again, with IGF-1 stimulation than with insulin, and the data uh, supported that. So here's an example where you can build a network, make predictions, and then this can lead you to understanding how to intervene in an optimal way rather than just random uh, testing of compound libraries. So in the future, in recapitulating the com complete liver microenvironment, uh, there is now a new uh, microphysiology uh, system uh, called the VLAMPS, so the vascularized liver acenus microphysiology system, which has vascular flow like the liver sinusoid. Uh, you can uh, uh, do things like add immune cells into that vascular flow and test for uh, immune infiltration into the disease model. You can actually also study extravasation and start by putting the cancer cells that are labeled into the vascular flow, 
see them bind to the primary, uh, 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 the liver sinusoidal uh, endothelial cells and then loc uh, translocate into the hepatic compartment. Uh, you can create a continuous liver oxygen zonation, which is uh, physiological, and uh, the system can be maintained for a month or more. So we're now in a position to have a model system where we can recreate the disease and use it to test therapeutics based on predictions made from the computational approaches. I mentioned before the importance of induced pluripotent stem cells. The real value going forward is the ability to collect patient skin cells to then generate induced pluripotent stem cells from those skin cells and then guide their development and maturation along different paths to particular cells, including cells of the liver, uh, like hepatocytes. Then those uh, IPS-derived cells can then be put into these microphysiology systems. So you can literally have you on a chip and get the testing uh, that is optimal for your genetic and environmental uh, background for your disease. So this will permit personalized drug testing and the ability to investigate in detail disease mechanisms in cohorts of patients of similar backgrounds. So the future of QSP is the ability to implement the full platform for diseases, starting with the patients, patient samples, and data to develop multi-scale experimental and computational models of the diseases for drug discovery along with PKPD for drug development, and to, to develop more patient-derived IPSC-based microphysiology experimental models to account for heterogeneous genomic and disease backgrounds for drug discovery and development. With that, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, various people that influenced me in thinking about uh, QSP. Thank you for listening to this lecture. I hope this uh, has given you information about QSP that you can utilize uh, in your work and studies. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact the program administrators. Thank you.